Good morning, everyone. And on behalf of Morag and I, welcome to this time of worship and to all those joining us online today. Um, we are going to begin by singing hymn 197, which we have to look up. You have to do some work today. <laughs> right, you got a wee seat to begin with. We're going to sing 197 and we remain seated for this but um, would you turn up also put your finger into 160 because we'll sing that right after it so first of all 197 followed by 160 praise my soul the king of heaven you won't have any words on the screen oh they're on the screen oh my goodness oh it might not last. So be prepared. <laughs> Let's see if that works. Oh, right. <laughs>
Let us pray. Almighty God, across the ages you have guided your people through the wilderness, assuring us of a home with you. Throughout all time you have been with your people in the seasons of life. You have given us the precious gift of time, time in your glorious creation, time with loved ones, time with your holy word, time to live, love, laugh, worship, and serve. How precious are these gifts, O God. We are grateful for your presence as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you have shown us the way of life and faith. But Father, we freely admit that too often we have been ungrateful children. We have failed to be good stewards of your creation. We have hurt loved ones and ignored our neighbours. We have neglected our faith and the teachings of Scripture. We have wasted precious time on stupid things that are of no value. Forgive us, O Lord, for not living as you taught us to live. Compassionate God, wash us with your grace. Renew us in your love. Equip us with courage and strength to be the followers of Christ that you need us to be. Infuse in us your spirit so that you will be the center of all that is and all that we are. And today with congregations all over Scotland, we bring you the plight of, people, of the people of Ukraine. We ask you to uphold all of those who have had to flee from their homes, those who are separated from their loved ones, and those who live in fear for the future. And now we join together in the prayer that your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our reading today is from John's Gospel, chapter 12, reading from verse 1 to verse 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
hear better now? Yes, good, good. So we're going to hear the story about Harriet Tubman, a hero of justice. And as I was saying, someone up at uh, Inverkip had been watching a film about this lady on the television, or on, I think it was Netflix last night. Araminta Ross was born as a slave sometime around 1820 in Maryland, USA. She never learned to read or write, but her mother filled her head with Bible stories. And as she grew up, her faith and her fate became powerfully entwined. And in the year 1849, it was a turning point. To best fulfill her destiny, she realized she must actively seek a role in God's plan rather than letting others dictate her path. She could no longer be a supplicant and trust in prayer for deliverance. By escaping to the north, she felt she would be doing God's will. In a remarkable escape, she made her way to freedom in Pennsylvania. And as was common for escaped slaves, she took on a new name, and that was to be called Harriet Tubman. And Harriet had helped, it was helped along the way by the Underground Railway. And this was the escape route from the south to the north and to freedom. Not content to leave her extended family behind in slavery, Harriet became a conductor, in inverted commas, on the railroad rescuing many members of her own family and hundreds of others, escorting them to freedom. And as a result, she was given the code name Moses, and she became a leading abolitionist in her day. And her success led to the slave owners posting a reward of $40,000 for her capture or her death, a lot of money. Thomas Garrett was the station master of the Underground Railway, and his observation of Harriet was, I never met with any person of any colour who had more confidence in the voice of God spoken direct to her soul. She could elude patrols and pursuers with as much ease and unconcern as an eagle would soar through the heavens. She had a faith in God and always asked him what to do and to direct her, which she said he always did. She would talk about consulting with God or asking of him just as one would consult with a friend on matters of business. And she said, he never deceived me. In the American Civil War, she served as a scout and as a nurse and she is considered the first African-American woman to serve in the military. In her later years, she continued to champion justice, this time joining the struggle for women's rights. Harriet is attributed as saying, it wasn't me, it was the Lord. I always trust him, I trust you. I don't know where to go, she would say, and I don't know what to do, but I expect you to lead me. And he always did. Harriet put her life on the line to help others find their way from slavery to freedom. And we're reminded of Jesus' words to his disciples and to us today. My commandment is this, love one another just as I love you. The greatest love a person can have for his friends is to give his life for them. And our speaker for this month is Jim Watrett from the Erskine Hospital. And I now invite Caroline to introduce him. Are you going to introduce him? Or? <laughs> I've done enough. <laughs> well, Jim, we, we welcome you here this morning. And uh, many people here are familiar with the work of the Erskine Hospital, but it's good that you're here with us. Good morning, everyone. As the carnage from the First World War battlefields mounted into the tens of thousands, the number of survivors who had lost limbs 
overwhelmed the only two hospitals specialising in the treatment of amputees at that time. Roehampton in London and Eden Hall in Musselburgh. And by the autumn of 1915, there were 2,000 limbless patients with nowhere to go. Sir William McEwen, the Regis Professor of Surgery at Glasgow University, had a worldwide reputation for advancing surgical procedures. He had presented the case for the need of a special hospital to the Royal College of Surgeons in 1915, and soon after was appointed to lead this project to establish this new hospital dedicated to treating those whose limbs had been disastrously wounded on the battlefield. He had also been commissioned as a Surgeon General in Scotland for the Royal Navy, with the rank of Surgeon Rear Admiral shortly after hostilities broke out. And his remit at that time was to look after the military wounded at Mount Stuart House in Butte and also at Dungavel, the former hunting lodge of the Dukes of Hamilton. Using his considerable influence, he assembled a powerful band of fellow surgeons and those in positions of influence, such as Sir Thomas Dunlop, the Lord Provost of Glasgow, and Sir Donald McAllister, the Principal of Glasgow University. He also invited powerful individuals from an engineering background, such as Sir Harold Yarrow, Chairman of Yarrow Shipyards, and Professor Archibald Barr of the world-renowned company Barn Stroud. Both were also present at this meeting in 1915 to discuss the formation of Erskine. Even though both lost sons at Ypres, they proved to be stalwart supporters of the hospital. And Sir William's theory at that time was if these companies and their highly skilled workforce can build ships, ships such as dreadnoughts and other precision equipment that fitted to one four thousandth part of an inch, they would have the ability to make artificial limbs. On the 29th of March 1916, Sir William convened a meeting in Glasgow City Chambers with the topic being the urgent need for a specialist hospital in Scotland to treat those who had lost limbs. This motion was unanimously approved and in the first few weeks public sympathy and support contributed £100,000 and this doubled within 12 months. This amounts to a staggering £16.5 million today, a remarkable amount of money, but unheard of in 1916. Prior to this meeting, the Lord Provost of Glasgow had written to Princess Louise, the Duchess of Argyll and Queen Victoria's fourth daughter, asking for her patronage. And on the 22nd of March 1916, she accepted, confirming the project as a first-rate idea. The location of the hospital was due to the generosity of another of Sir William's friends, Thompson Aikman, who donated free of charge his home, Erskine House and its grounds in Bishopton for the duration of the war and for 12 months afterwards. Sadly, when the 12 months after the war had passed, there were still thousands of service personnel that required replacement limbs. Sir John Reid of the North British Locomotive Company then provided the funds to buy Thompson Aikman's house. And as long as we used it as a hospital, we could have it for free. The first wounded patients were actually admitted on the 10th of October 1916, the first of 14 residents. And the first role, name in the role was a Corporal James Ritson of Troon. He was in the 1st and 5th Battalion of the Royal Scots Fusiliers, awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal for Bravery at Gallipoli, but was also severely wounded in the same campaign, suffering 22 wounds after a Turkish mine exploded in his bombing pit, resulting in the amputation of his left forearm. On the 6th of June 1917, the hospital officially opened and was known as the Princess Louise Scottish Hospital for Limbless Sailors and Soldiers. And its motto at the time, I was broken for you. 
There's nothing sinister the fact that there's no mention of the Air Force. It was simply that the Royal Air Force didn't come into existence until 1918. The first patient we can find from this area was admitted on the 21st of November 1916, and he was actually our 73rd admission. Gunner Alexander Hunter, aged 28, from Millhouse Kelly in Weems Bay, was a gardener prior to the war before he joined the Royal Field Artillery. And he had his right leg amputated, believed to be from an action on the Western Front. He was discharged on Boxing Day 1916. Private Duncan Grant, aged 29, from the 5th Battalion, the Cameronians, originally came from Mount Pleasant in Skelmerley, was also admitted to Erskine around about 1919. Our first artificial limbs were made of beech, which proved to be less flexible and did nothing for the well-being of the patient being uncomfortable and cumbersome. It was therefore decided to construct the limbs from willow, which was more flexible and easier to manufacture into something resembling the real thing. Willow trees from all over the country were soon donated by the landed gentry, including Lord Blyswood, who donated 25 from his land around Renfrewshire. Two trees from Glasgow University were also allegedly donated after a meeting between Sir William McEwen and Sir Donald McAllister. He asked if he could have the trees. And the Dean said, of course you can have the trees. If you write, I'll take it to the university court. I can't see it being a problem. The trees disappeared that afternoon, and I believe the university are still awaiting a letter requesting these. <laughs> As both Sir William and Harold Yarrow decreed that the mental state of the patients would be uplifted if they did not look like cripples, they had the limbs manufactured to look as realistic as possible, which also enabled the veterans to live as normal a life as possible with the dignity and respect they deserved. The number of limbs that were required soon exceeded all expectations, and a number of shipyards on both sides of the Clyde formed a consortium to alleviate this issue. These included Scots of Linthouse and Fairfields and Govan. And in 1919, eight of Erskine's double amputees demonstrated walking, running and dancing before an astonished audience at the Key Industries exhibition, and three even performed an encore of climbing a ladder. So in the 100 plus years since its inception, the original Erskine Hospital has grown from strength to strength, and it is indeed now much more than a dedicated hospital and more like a veteran's village. The Erskine home is one of four dedicated homes that we have we have Erskine Park and the Erskine Home in Bishopton. We have a home in Glasgow and a home in Edinburgh. Our mission has changed many times in the past and now is to offer veterans their best possible future through the best possible care and community of support with our vision simply being a Scotland where veterans and their families thrive. So how do we intend to move Erskine forward? With our residential veterans getting older and older and applications for admission reducing, we are now soul-searching for how we look after the veterans' community going forward. And an initiative that started in 2018, our activity centre, based in Bishopton, has proved to be a real success. This centre provides social interaction on a daily basis for veterans that live in their own homes. The activities and facilities and offer include woodworking, IT, art and photography. And for the princely sum of two pounds, there is unlimited teas, coffees, as well as a cooked lunch. We opened this as a 12 month project in 2018, and we recently celebrated its fourth birthday. And such has been the success of this, we have now extended the site to enable us to increase the amount of attendees from 20 to 40 a day. And one of our chief executive's visions of the future is that Erskine will open more of these sites throughout Scotland, with the next one opening on the site of the old Leon Coyle Hospital in Forres, with work starting this year. And he also sees Erskine potentially caring for veterans in their own homes in the years to come. Our five assisted living apartments on the estate opened in November 2018 
as a result of a very generous legacy left in the supporters' will, and provides accommodation and services to fiercely independent elderly or disabled veterans and or their spouse, enabling them to live in their new home for as long as possible with access to a range of support services. Due to the pandemic delaying the building of our 24 single living flats, we just opened them earlier on this year. And you'll all have seen some horror stories of soldiers and sailors and airmen living on the streets. So these 24 flats will be for single veterans and we will look after them for up to two years. And in that two year period, we will also put them in touch with all the services that they need wherever in Scotland that they would like to live, be that housing, benefits, or even something simple as doctors and dentists. And like most charitable organisations, we are heavily reliant on fundraising. And we need to raise 10 million in 2022 alone, just to keep running. These homes would not be possible without the selfless dedication of everyone who has ever raised money for Erskine. Our volunteers, churches, WIs, uniformed youth organisations, serving military and independent fundraisers who happily give up their time to participate in a variety of activities. The donations we receive from our sponsors and donors are paramount to the running of Erskine, as sadly without them we wouldn't be able to function. Ladies and gents, thank you for the invite to come along and speak to you today. On behalf of everyone involved with Erskine, staff, veterans, residents, thank you for everything you've done in the past for us and hopefully will continue to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for that. I didn't know very much about Erskine, but uh, that wonderful, wonderful um, work. And the, just thinking the, the vision that of way back in 1915 is still, still going on. I was wondering um, about the people from this area way back then who did get artificial limbs. But wonder what happened to them. Maybe if MD maybe knows somebody that knew them way back. Um, it would be interesting just to see how, how they fared in life and what happened now. But thank you very much for sharing that and just informing us of the, the work that is ongoing and is still very much in need. And we encourage folks to support this month's charity of Erskine, Erskine Hospital. We are going to sing again and this time oh, it's on the screen. <laughs> oh God, you search me and you know me.
Oops. Try not to. <laughs> Who doesn't love the chance to get together with our closest friends? An opportunity to share our joys and also our sorrows, to exchange stories and reminiscences, fun, laughter, and perhaps a few tears. There are so many occasions in life where we want, or perhaps I should say need, our friends around us. Unfortunately, over the last couple of years, we have, on many occasions, been denied that pleasure. Weddings celebrated quietly, or perhaps even postponed until larger gatherings were allowed. Baptisms delayed. Last goodbyes shared over the internet for those fortunate enough to have access. Birthdays spent alone without friends or family around to share the day. My husband Ian's 70th birthday was on March the 19th, 2020. We hoped to have a party on Saturday the 21st. That wouldn't work. Our daughter Janet was running a course that day, so we decided to celebrate the weekend before. And weren't we so glad we did? Lockdown hit us all like a sledgehammer. And it would be more than six months before we were able to be with our grandchildren again. And even then, that had to be outside of either family home. The pandemic made it a very difficult time for many, and I'm sure that many of the residents of Erskine must have been particularly hard hit. Our Bible reading today is set in a time when there were no such restrictions in place, although getting from place to place was very much more difficult then than it is today. It was a party, you know, a dinner party because that's where we get the chance to share all the really good things happening in our lives, right? Sharing a meal with people we love, laughing over a glass of wine, telling stories, building memories. And they were all there, the whole motley crew, the 12 that followed Jesus up the road and down again, and the three, the siblings, Martha, Mary, Lazarus, who loved Jesus and hosted him time and again. And this was a special party, truly special. Lazarus had been, well, there's no other way to put it but the bald truth. Lazarus had been dead. And then he wasn't, because Jesus said, come out. But like many parties often do, this one wound down to just three people people in the spotlight? Jesus. Because, well, he was Jesus after all. And Judas, because he asked hard questions and flings accusations. And Mary. Mary, right here in the deep misogynistic world of the first century Palestine, the one in the fullest glare of the spotlight, the one truly faithful disciple turns out to be a woman. All the guys are there, the crusty fisherman, the bickering brothers, the tax collector, the one who sat under the fig tree, and they've all been there for the last three years, covered in dust, sprinkled with Galilean water, living the daily ins and outs of the Jesus life. Yet, somehow, they missed it. They missed the point of it all, the thrust of their mission, the terrifying end of the story they didn't even know they were telling. But Mary, Mary gets it. She is so full of the glorious, heartbreaking truth that it literally pours forth from her body. She comes to the end of the dining couch where Jesus is reclining by the table. She bends down, opens a wildly expensive vial of fragrant oil and pours it over her, her, his feet, loosing her hair to rub it right into the cracks and crevices, scandalizing everyone in the room, except the one she came to anoint. Because you see, 
she had been paying attention. Like that other Mary, she was pondering these things in her heart, listening with care. As Judas snarled, Jesus calmed the storm. Leave her alone. This perfume has been stashed away for just today to prepare me for my burial. Even here, on the eve of his own brutal death, Jesus insists on changing up the rules for acceptable behavior. He shuts down what we might call the churchy attitude, the self-righteous platitudes, and he elevates the simple but loving actions of a contemplative woman. What we do and why and how we do it, that is what counts. It's not so much what we say or even what we believe, it's what we do. Because the take home truth is this, the surest sign of a true disciple is a life lived following Jesus' example and teaching. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 14 tells us, let all that you do be done in love. Amen. Now we're going to sing him just as I am without one plea. Now it was taken from Mission Praise and if the words are on the board and we have no problems, we're singing the Mission Praise version. Should we lose the words, you will find the words in CH4 at page at number 553 and we're singing it today to the tune Woodworth.
And now we come to God with our prayers of intercession. Let us pray together. Lord God, we give thanks that you are a God of love, grace, justice, and mercy. Your goodness lasts forever, and you call us, just as we are, to come to you. Through Christ, your Son, our Saviour, your love for us is revealed. And so, in this moment, time and place, we just pause to reflect on all that we have heard today. The sacrificial love of Mary at Bethany and the gospel challenges. Harriet Tubman's trust in Jesus, enabling her to put her life on the line for others. For Jim Redman, Workman and his work of Erskine Hospital to care for service men and women who put their lives on the line in the service of our nation. Lord of the years, may we commit ourselves to your transforming power. Startle, challenge and confront us. Touch our hearts with your heart of compassion so that we may see and serve you and yield to all that your love demands. Lord God, give us new eyes for seeing and hands to reach out and help in whatever ways we can when presented with the many human stories that touch our hearts on a daily basis and which make us weep and ask questions about the injustices in our world. Lord, hear us as we pray for our broken world where many cry out for peace, for justice and freedom from oppression and corrupt regimes. We pray for the increasing areas of conflict around the world and the many innocents who have been killed, those who have been injured, those who are refugees and those children who are orphaned. All around the world, this is going on and it is beyond our experience and we are reduced to tears we want peace for them we want them to have a safe place to call home we want justice for all and we want it for all peoples help us to pray without ceasing for your will to be done our thoughts and prayers again are very much with the president of ukraine and his people we weep with those who weep. Come, Lord Jesus, Prince of Peace, come. Come and comfort your people. And then, Lord God, how hard it is to pray for those who perpetrate violence and show no mercy towards those they believe threaten their authority. We pray for the Russian people who who dare to speak truth to power and have incurred the wrath of Putin. And we would pray for him. We we'll, may find it difficult, Lord, but we would ask that you would melt his hard heart and stubborn will. And all we can do is to hand these prayers over to you, praying that your almighty will will be done. We pray for our own country, for the Queen and her family in this Platinum Jubilee year. We pray too for our Prime Minister and the Government and all the MPs, and for our Scottish Executive and all those in leadership positions, that you would grant them wisdom and a real heart for the people they have been elected to serve. And now in the stillness, let us name before God those known to us who are going through difficult times at present. Those who have been bereaved. Those who are ill and in hospital. Those who are at home. And for those who wait by a bedside. 
Lord of all, we commit these concerns for the people we love into your heart of compassion. Bless them and let your will be done. Bless us as a congregation in this place. Guide us to be faithful witnesses. Lord of all, there will be challenges in the week ahead. Be our strength and guide. Hear these are prayers and the, pray and the prayers of our hearts in Jesus' name, who is the same yesterday, today and forever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is Sing to God's Glory. And the last verse, I love these words and I give them to you this morning. Sing for God's saints who have travelled faith's journey before us and who in our weariness give us their hope to restore us. In them we see the new creation to be, spirit of love made flesh for us. So may we go forward into this new week with confidence that our Lord is with us. So we sing now, sing for God's glory. May the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes, the love of God be reflected in your hands, the wisdom of God be reflected in your words, and the knowledge of God flow from your heart that all may see, and seeing believe, and may all that you do be done in love. Amen. Amen.